Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. I think we have an exciting uh, talk ahead of us. Uh, we have Stacy Rolf, who owns R and R Ranch, uh, and they have many horses and some many donkeys. Uh, there was a huge article in the paper about them where I got the idea to call her. So I think you all will be excited to have her talk and then we are going to have her bring a few mini horses, maybe two. And we're gonna have her come initially to the AL entrance uh, where IL people can come over and meet them and then we'll bring them through the hall down to AL and then, then in an elevator to go to the care center. So we think it'll be a fun day. They'll be here about an hour that day. Um, that's October the 10th. I think it's the 10th. Um, and so they'll be here for about an hour that day. So we're hoping you all will come and see them at AL and maybe follow us down the Golden Golden Road to uh, AL. So here we go with Stacy. I hope you enjoy her. Thank you all so much. Um, like Nancy said, my name is Stacy Rolf, and I own R and R Ranch Miniature Horse Sanctuary. Uh, and one of the questions that I often get, um, and I'd like to explain before we get started, is, "Gosh, did you grow up doing this, or are you a vet, or things like that?" And the simple answer is no to any of the questions that you may think about me. Um, this all really happened quite by accident. Um, the piece of property that we own, um, which is right in, in Wildwood, uh, when my husband and I bought it nearly 10 years ago, it was just an open field. And we developed it, put in the utilities, all that stuff, we built our house. And I said to my husband, because my daughter does ride horses, and we had horses at that time, and I said, you know, I think there's room for us to put a little small barn here. And um, so we had agreed that we were going to put a little two-stall barn. We were gonna bring my daughter's first pony home. We were gonna bring her first horse home. And we were gonna have kind of a new life for us, taking care of horses at home. And it wasn't long after we made that decision that my daughter said, Mom, we should get a mini. And I was like, we should get a mini. Yeah. And so we, um, we had made that decision. She immediately went online and she started searching for miniature horses and um, up popped a pair that were in Kansas. They were for sale on Craigslist. And we did nothing more than read the description about them online, saw their picture, and I said, okay, let's take them. So the woman drove them in there about six hours away, drove them in, she was very nice, her and her husband, very nice. But here's where the whole problem started. <laughs> Those horses were babies, basically. They were two years old, that's very young. So they were two years old, and we were their fourth owner. Oh. We had the same reaction that you just had. Oh. And we thought, what is wrong that these horses are going around to so many people? And my first thought is, well, there's gotta be something wrong with these horses. They probably have a terrible personality, or they're sick all the time, or something. And it really wasn't. It, it, they were fine, they were skittish, but, um, the problem was we joined some groups, we started to learn uh, about miniature horses and, um, and came to understand that miniature horses have a very low value to them. Full-size horses have a different value, okay? They can be ridden, they can be shown, they're useful. Uh, miniature horses are not so useful in this world, quite honestly. Um, they can be shown and they can pull carts and wagons and they can have a job like that. They can certainly be a great companion uh, to a person or to another horse, but their, their quotient for, for their value goes way down. And so people think, like I did, and I thought, oh my gosh, but they're so cute. Bring them on in. And, and so people think they're so cute, they're little, this will be fun, let's do it. 
and, um, and we have learned a, a big learning curve that they're a lot of work. And so we have nothing against people getting miniature horses. In fact, we encourage it, but we want people to be well prepared for what they're getting. So much like a bunny at Easter that oftentimes parents will put a baby bunny in a Easter basket, you're not prepared for the destruction that they can cause. And I have one of those too. So at any rate, today is just gonna be about a few of our horses and some of the backgrounds that they have. And like Nancy said, we'll be back and um, we'll bring some magic with us. We'll bring some of the horses with us and you guys will get to interact with them, pet them, brush them, love on them. They're, they're really a lot of fun. So let me show you just a few things. So this is Baker that you're looking at. And I know Baker looks really cute in this picture. Um, we've had him since he was two years old. He was sold at an auction in um, Ohio. Let me show you, this is his uh, for sale ad. Let me show it to you. So the first thing that it shows, if you look at, read what it says, coming March 21st, Peanut, that's what his name was, is a two-year-old dwarf. And the word dwarf is all in caps. And the reason that it's all in caps is because when you see the size of a dwarf miniature horse, they are the littlest horses that are out there. And people often make the mistake and think, oh, that's what I want because that's so cute and I feel like we could watch a movie together. And that couldn't be further from the truth. But they do highlight, um, oh, here we go. They do highlight the, the word dwarf. And so because of that, dwarfs have gotten to be really expensive if you wanna buy them from an auction. And Baker, at this time he was called Peanut, he was no exception. I make it a rule never to go to auctions. I know what they're like and I don't wanna be there because I know it's too heartbreaking. So when I bought him, I bought it from the convenience of my kitchen and I was watching him live for sale on the screen and I was on the phone bidding on him and I'm happy that we were able to get him. So let me show you. You see up here it says he's quiet and friendly. They're just pointing out a couple of attributes about him. Let me show you what they really didn't show you about him. And that is his feet. And that's his feet. So this right here, if you see this uh, portion right in there, that's hollowed out. That was filled with maggots. Uh, it's, it's as if you would take your, your front, your, your right hand and put it underneath you. That's how he was walking. And, and this right here is all turned in. These are turned out, turned out. Now you can see how straight that is. That means that whoever owned him, they didn't know how to fix him, but at least I'll give them this. They, they just cut it off so to stop the growth. So at least he didn't have horrendous growth that we have seen, but he certainly didn't do him a whole lot of any favors. So sadly, he had to live like that for two years because that's how old he was when he was sold. Uh, oh, that's backwards. Okay, so this is going to show you what he was like when I was checking him over when he came home. You can see he's got some scratches up here, some cuts, these marks on his cheek, his nose, and over here on his uh, other cheek, that's all from his halter that was so tight, so small on him, it was growing into his skin. So Baker was really in this down, depressed, traumatic state of being, and he was, um, down and out. I mean, he, he's not resting, he's not sleeping. He had no real spirit to get up. So this, if you see the date, it's April 2nd, 2020. It was the very beginning of the pandemic. And vets were only going out on emergencies, which he was. So you can see her mask on. 
and giving him um, a checkup was, yes, he, this is an emergency basis. So you can also see this circle down here. That's a corrective shoe. So we work very closely with another organization that's based in Florida. They happened to be in Ohio at this time. I asked them to intervene, get him, and they started correcting his feet for me before we got him. So that's what this is. This is a shoe to try to pull that hoof out, and then they're bonded into it to try to retrain the growth of that leg, those ligaments, and help him have a, um, a, a straighter leg. So these marks right here, that all is an indication that he was uh, completely starved. And so we had to follow um, a protocol through UC Davis on re-nourishing starved horses. So instead of feeling like, oh, let me feed you, you you're so hungry, it was very small meals, six times a day. And it, we followed that protocol for weeks on end until we could increase quantities, decrease the quantities, um, increase the, the, the amount, and decrease the number of times. So um, over time, Baker got better, and his feet got better. He got his strength. He was extremely afraid of dogs. And you can see, I mean, there's a carriage in here. This is my garage. So we always quarantine our horses in my garage. Out go the cars, in goes the horse. And we put up this temporary stall, and that's where we quarantine horses for no less than 30 days. While he was in quarantine, because it's right outside my door, they're completely under my care. And if they're under my care, my gold retriever is with us, with me all the time who is extremely friendly. Um, Baker, however, was extremely aggressive and uh, afraid of dogs. And, and, and it doesn't take a whole lot to start putting the puzzle together. Why is he afraid? Well, chances are dogs have chased him all his life, or they've bitten at his back heels, or they've chewed on him in some other way. Maybe that bite that was on his forehead, maybe that was from a dog bite, you don't know. But you can understand why a horse is afraid of dogs. So over time, when I had Baker out with me and I would sit all bundled up in a chair on my driveway and let him graze in the front yard, and my, my dog, whose name is Handsome, the golden retriever, would just lay by, lay by me. And he would be in Baker's space and never getting up to go near him or annoy him. So, Little by little, he started to learn that there was no threat from our dog. And as recent as last December, there's another social media platform that's called the Dodo. And the Dodo does all these, I want to say, kind of rags to riches stories on animals that are usually abused, some kind of sad story, and then they have a happy ending. <clears throat> Well, in this case, they did a story on Baker's relationship with our dog. So it was um, really pretty special to see. At any rate, we had to work very closely with our vet, with our farrier. That's the person that fixes feet. And, um, and over time, Baker responded. And his uh, spiritual health, his his well-being improved, his physical well-being improved, and today Baker is six and a half years old, and I'll show you how he, this, this is actually gonna be an older video that I'm gonna show you, but you'll see that he is quite the happy boy uh, running out there. He can run around, he can kick up his heels. Actually, Baker is extremely fast these days. And um, so when we see this, it makes us really happy. Oh, there goes Ted. <laughs> So this is Teddy Bear right here. Um, Ted. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that, that's unreal. So when we see our horses outside running, it really does something to us because we have seen our horses at their worst. And people who drive by all the time I know they bring a big smile to everybody's face, and they think, oh, let's go see if the minis are out. 
but most people that drive by don't know what they're looking at and they don't get the feeling that we get, which is, ah, oh, thank you God, you know, these horses are healthy now. So that's Baker. Um, this is George. Oh, wow. And this is uh, an actual image of George at an auction. So he was sold when he was seven months old. Um, Sadly, there is a large community in this world that breeds and tries to breed for a dwarf. Um, they are the same community that also breeds a lot of puppies, and um, and it's just a, it's just a sad fact of life that this group of people is very large out in the world. Um, but so here's George, seven months old, at an at an auction. I happened on the day of this auction, we happened to be having our holiday open house, and I was busy. We have 500 people come in and out that day, and I was very busy, and I told my daughter, I said, it's up to you. If you could get him, we'll take him, because we saw his feet. So let me just show you a little bit about George, and it, whoops, let me go back here. But that's George, there's his feet, here's a better look at what he was um, all about. So, you know, again, if the wrong person ends up with him, and any one of you, if you outbid everyone else, the horse goes home with you. No questions asked. No, nobody's gonna say, do you have a barn? Have you got shelter? Do you have a vet? Do you have a vet? that knows how to take care of miniature horses, not only miniatures, but dwarfs. So do they have the tools to be able to use on those horses? Do they know how to dose them? Uh, do you have a farrier that is specialized in these unique feed needs? No questions. Not even do you have a trailer to take the thing home? Oh. Nothing. I mean, whoever spends the most money goes home. So these horses are at a great risk for going home with the wrong people, and they go home with the wrong people all the time. So this right here shows George. I had a house full of people um, for the holidays at this time, and I came out into the garage again, and I was just trying to comfort him. Uh, this was when he just, his first evening home with us, it was a long drive when we picked him up in Ohio and got him back home. It was a long day. And so you have to think about what is possibly going through these horses' minds. You know, one minute he's with his mother, the next minute he's on a sale block. Next minute he's sold and we bought him and I had a mutual friend with a farm in Ohio, so I said, can he please stay with you until we can get up there? So he's gone from mother to auction, to a temporary farm, to our transportation van, and now to us, all within five or six days. I mean, the confusion that goes on in their minds is, is something that I, I just can't stand. Um, so this is how we actually go about fixing their feet. This is my laundry room, and, um, and George is, he's got his eyes closed, but he's not sedated. He's just hanging out, literally just sleeping at this point. This is my daughter, and then this is our farrier. I have to fly him in from Florida every time we do our dwarf's feet. It's that specialized. So these are some of the tools that we use, and um, this right here shows you this product, a mixture of two products that we use to create the bond that will keep the hoof into the shoe, or if we have to create and build up their hoof so that they're uh, standing flat on the ground. Everything is like a fine art. Uh, the combination that you use to create the mixture, the temperature, it has to be frozen and thawed and everything is just very exact. Now this shows, again, he's like an artist, putting it on his hoof and, and making sure with the foam board that nothing moves and that everything is going to create this flat balance for George so that his hooves start to grow straight. The big plus when we get a baby is that 
their feet and their, their ligaments, their cartilage is much more pliable, and we've got much more opportunity for a successful outcome. Um, then we have to go in, we've got to um, dry everything. Oh, this is just more putting on more of the product, so I'll fast forward through that, but this shows um, the end result. You can see how nice it looks, and then it has to be dried for about five minutes so that you know it's not uh, gonna make the wrong impression. And then this is George right after that. So we'll, you'll see how he walks, and it's very stiff-legged, almost Frankenstein-ish, because all of a sudden, his legs are, are different, and he's not used to walking flat-footed. But this right here shows you, oh, I missed one. Well, this shows you a fast forward version of how George turned out, okay? So you'll see George is doing just fine. And he's also in here with Tubby. And I think I've got Tubby on this. But you can see how silly these boys are and how happy they are. And they're just in their stall having a, a grand old time together. Um, I think they, the, I think George is going to run out and come back in a second. It's pretty cute. So right here, they're both stallions, believe it or not, and that's trouble. So, uh, so they did have to both be gelded. But look at how silly they are. They're so ridiculously cute. Um, but you can see George's feet. He's flat. He doesn't even have his extensions on anymore. So, so that's our boys. I, uh, I call them my babies. <laughs> All right, so that's George. Eleanor is another victim of abuse. You can see the abuse right here. This is uh, a traumatic injury that she suffered as a result of a, of a person, unfortunately. This right here in her eye, this little blue line, this is uh, the result of an ulcer in her eye that went untreated. So we've had horses that have had ulcers before. We've had one horse who had an ulcer in both eyes and one was so bad it was about to burst and we had to race him down to Mizzou to the veterinary school so that they could um, hopefully try to save it and they did. They saved his eye and his eyesight but Eleanor went untreated. So she is blind in that eye. Uh, this is her sale. Uh, so she was sold at an auction at the grand old age of 19 years old. Wow. So imagine what that means. She's 19 years old. She looks ancient. Um, and yet, we don't know. Like, wh what was Eleanor's life like? Did she belong to someone who loved her? Or did she live her life going from auction to auction, which a lot of horses sadly do? Or did she live with someone for three years and another person for five years? You know, a lot of times horses have almost a lifelong of foster homes. They come and go throughout households all the time. And so it's really sad when you think about the, the amount of times a horse changes ownership. This right here, this yellow sticker, that's her sale. That's her sticker ad. Um, so I knew I wanted her. I knew I wanted, she was very haggard looking. She was very old. And oh, I just flash forward through. But this is Eleanor today. So she is, um, she is Santa's helper at our holiday open house. She does an excellent job. She stands guard at our, we have a big red mailbox uh, for the kids to put their letters in and she is a, a great big helper. So, so Eleanor not only is just about as sweet as she looks, but Eleanor had a secret that she failed to tell anyone about when we got her. And that is because she was so old, because she was 19 <laughs> years old, we never once even crossed our mind that Eleanor could possibly be pregnant. <laughs> and yet she was. <laughs> and so we did not know this until the following spring. Wow. And it was after we, so you can see Eleanor's fluffy, she's got on getting her winter coat going. When our horses have their winter coats on, they're literally like a bunch of woolly mammoths. They're just like guinea pigs and, and fluffy and furry. 
And so it's very easy to mistake what their true body type is. And so come that next spring in June, when we were shaving everybody's coats off and getting them cool for the summer, I looked at her and I was almost mortified. Yeah. And I said, oh my gosh, um, Eleanor's, this is not right. She's got this big belly. You know, here we are patting ourselves on our back, like, oh, we're doing such a good job with Eleanor. She's really getting weight well. And, um, and instead, she had this big belly and I could see her hip bones. So I called my vet. I said, do you think Eleanor could be pregnant? And she said, well, let's back up the math. So horses are pregnant for 11 months out of the year. We were right about nine and a half months, 10 months maybe. And uh, she came out that following Monday, did an ultrasound, and she said, you got a baby. So that same day, I took her out of her stall, walked her down to my garage, where I had Baker living still, took him out. I said, okay, we're gonna cut your quarantine short by a week, put him in the barn, put her in my garage, and to that day, one week later, she delivered a baby. And so in that very first video, when you saw Teddy Bear shoot across the screen, that was her baby. That was her baby. And he was born six weeks early because of her age. So she was 20 when she delivered. So he was born six weeks premature. He weighed 11 pounds at birth. So he was extremely tiny and I had to, they both had to live in intensive care at the vet for about a week. Um, okay, so that's Eleanor, let me see. Okay, so here's the girls. So these guys are not miniature horses. These guys are not dwarfs. Eleanor was not a dwarf. These are all miniature horses here. So this is, we call them the girls, but this is Millie, Poppy, and Toasty right here. They were the worst case of animal cruelty in the state of Missouri in 2018 for horses. So when we found out about them through our vet, um, the decision to take all three of them was, who's gonna want them? I mean, who wants girls that are, have been so neglected, they're going to have lifelong health issues. I had been given permission to talk to the vet who was treating them, and she just happened to be our vet as well, and she said they will always founder, they will always have laminitis. And she said, and this one is a wicked kicker. And I thought, you know what, who's, who's gonna want them? So I, I said, we'll take all three of them. Here they are, here's their condition when they first came in. This is what true neglect looks like. So watch their feet as they get on the scale. And this is what, this is what happens when you don't take care of a horse. That's their hoofs, look at their ratty manes, that's our farrier starting to trim off uh, some length on their hoofs. So it's a process. And for these girls, it took about a year to get them in shape. Here he has to actually use a sawzall to get that hoof off. It was so long and so overgrown. So now I know that these girls look like, well, they don't seem that bad. They're standing there pretty, pretty well. And, and Toasty is standing there while she's getting her mane just completely trying to go through this, all these knots and burrs. And you think to yourself, well, they don't seem like they're that bad. Well, the problem is, is that horses go through phases. Once they've been through such a trauma of neglect, they go through this, uh, I, don't care, I don't care what happens to me face. You know, like they're just at the end of their rope. Like there's no joy in their life and they really just don't care. You want to pull on my mane, pull on my mane. You know, you want, you want me to hold my leg up, I'll hold it up. They just, they don't care. But then what happens is the girls start to come to life once they get normal feeding and water and a clean place to live. Then they start to notice the world again. And when they notice the world, it's not like Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing me this food. You're such a nice person. I'm glad I landed here. It's not like that at all. It's, it's, starvation is in their mind, so it's, give me that food. And they become very aggressive. And so these three girls became a very dangerous 
situation to go in and take care of. Um, and, and it's not easy when you walk into a barn and you've got three of them surrounding you, ears pinned, ready to kick, ready to bite, the whole nine yards. So the first thing we had to do is we had to teach them some manners. And the manners meant if you want to eat, you have to, you have to get a halter on, we're going to tie you next to your bowl and you can eat your food. And that may sound a little harsh, but they had to be approachable. They had to be, uh, I, I couldn't risk anyone that was working at the barn getting hurt, which one had already gotten bit. Um, so it seems like before we knew it, they learned. And they're like, okay, I stand here. Uh, I'm gonna get my food and I stand here and I'm gonna pin my ears, but I'm standing here and I'm waiting. So they learned. And I didn't have room for them at the barn. A lot of people say, well, how many can you take? Well, we have a 10 stall barn. It was nine. We took out our wash rack and we made that a 10 stall. And I didn't have room for three. So I actually went out to St. Charles and I met with a shed dealer. And I said, here's the specs, here's the size I need. And, um, and this is what we ended up with. So we made their own little barn, and we had it wired for electricity, and they have an automatic fly spray in there, they have three fans, so they have everything that anyone in our main barn has. But what this also gave them is outside back here is their fenced-in paddock, and it gave them a chance that they could come and go whenever they wanted, they didn't need to live under our thumb. We didn't ask anything of them. And it gave them a chance to just start to understand that this is life, this is their new life. And so little by little, and I mean little by little, they started to open up. Now I would not say that these girls are socially balanced in their mind when it comes to people. They are still our most dangerous horses and our riskiest horses but they are socially balanced amongst other horses now, and they weren't when we got them. So they're happy. They might not be the best, and I would never bring them around people to say, hey, why don't you pet Poppy? Oh. But, um, uh, but they're happy horses, and you can see in this clip here, this shows how happy they are running around. Now they play with all of our horses, but for a long time they were separate because they were not, uh, they were very aggressive to the other horses. And so we had to really introduce them slowly, but they're completely happy now. Um, this is just something that I'll, I'll tell you about, just touch on it briefly, because a lot of times grandparents, parents, we all unwittingly know that we've put a child on a pony's back at a pumpkin patch or uh, the county fair, or the city's you know events that they have going on. And this is something we like to point out. This is not a happy life for horses. So this is called a carousel where horses are actually chained. Uh, you can see it's pretty dark, but there's chains on each side that that hook the horse to these, um, these carousels and they go in circles. Um, this is an ad that is out there in the world and you can see this child, I mean basically he could walk while he's on this baby, on this, on this miniature horse. So this sends a message to people from this ad that, uh, hey, you can put a kid on him. And we try very hard to, um, to try to educate people that there's a certain limit that can go on these horses back before hurting them. And it's 20% of their body weight. So we have a big scale at home. Horses just step on it. And we keep track of our horses' weights all the time. One of our horses came from Arkansas, and I'll show you him. He weighs 215 pounds, give or take. Let's say 20% of that, roughly 40 pounds. I bought his saddle that came with him. His saddle weighs 19 pounds. So now we're talking about an 18 month, 24 month old toddler could get on his back. Not a six, seven, eight year old child. And that's who are on these kids' backs. This is Banks, he was our pony ride guy in Arkansas. All these marks on him, these are bite marks from all the ponies that he lived with that were bigger than him. 
and you can see his eyes, how dark, deep, weathered they look. He was 18 years old when he came to us on Halloween in 2018. Um, there's those bite marks. That's tough. He's little. I mean, Banks, um, Banks is small enough that I could bring him in here. Uh, he's that small. So we start, with, like we do all of our horses, we get their health in order. This is uh, our farrier. So I have one farrier that does all of our regular miniature horses, and I have one farrier that I bring in for our dwarfs. So this is how they trim a horse's feet. They put them up on a pedestal, and it's much like you do your fingernails. This is a file. They use clippers, and they're basically just keeping the growth in check. This is our vet. You can see Banks looks pretty sleepy here. This is a contraption that is keeping his mouth open. And what she was doing then is going to insert like a long rod into his mouth and um, file his teeth because he was getting points on them and that hurts on the inside of your mouth. So we get all of these things um, corrected for the horses. And then this ultimately became Banks' new job in life. And he was in uh, an assisted living home here, and you can see someone is brushing him, petting him, and um, people enjoyed uh, spending time with Banks. He's, um, he's got the personality of a tiny little saint. Um, he doesn't, there is not one bad thing that I could say about Banks. But right now, at the um, age of 24, he doesn't necessarily have the patience that he used to. So we don't take him uh, places like we used to because he's kind of over it. You know, he's like, just let me do whatever I want. Um, and uh, okay, this is Clarence. I think this might be the last one I'm going to show you. But Clarence was also a pony ride. So you could see that Clarence is taller. He's big. Uh, so ponies are bigger than a miniature horse. This was Florida. So he was a pony ride guy for his entire life. His last six years, he was retired. And this is where people retired him, into this very much of a jungle-like thicket in uh, Midwest, uh, the mid-state of Florida, kind of in the Ocala area. Um, so he had no interaction with people, no interaction with horses. You can briefly watch him as he emerges on this path right here. You'll see him coming out. And this is just a really sad life that Clarence lived all by himself. I think they told us that there were some cats that lived there. And the woman did not want to give him up, but then she finally acquiesced and gave him up. So when we got Clarence, uh, it's only been two years, uh, but you can see his hip bones, how thin he was. He was very afraid of people, and even to this day, I still work with him on making eye contact. He likes to go like this, and then just look at you kind of from the side. He won't look at you straight on, and that makes me sad, because I don't know what has happened to him in his life. But again, here's our vet doing, um, listening to his gut sounds and checking his eyes. He barely has any teeth, so he has to have special food and fixed in a special way. Um, so we named him Clarence after the movie It's a Wonderful Life. So once we moved the girls out of their barn, Clarence went in and renamed. we renamed the barn It's a Wonderful Life. Um, because Clarence had been living by himself for so long, he actually was very aggressive towards other horses, and we had a hard time finding a friend for him. But um, we persevered, and we finally did find a good match for him, and he is, um, he is so happy now. So this is the last one that I'm going to show you. This is Eugene, and let me show you Eugene. This was how we saw him at an auction in uh, Nixon, Missouri. He is a full-size donkey. He is a full-size donkey, and, it, and, and you can see him, how painful it is for him to walk. So when we went to this auction, this was the first and only and my last auction that I will ever go to. And I went with my daughter, and the reason we decided to go is that there were three dwarfs that were coming for sale. Two looked fine, one had bad feet. We said, you know what, let's see if we can go get them. 
So we took an appropriate sized um, transport for a small dwarf. And in my mind, I had a dollar amount that I was not going to spend above. Because dwarfs have gotten so out of control, people are willing to pay so much money for them now, even though they know nothing about them, they want them as a novelty, and I don't want to reward these breeders for what they're doing, but if I could have gotten them, I would. So when the dwarfs uh, were going to be coming through the sail pen, we had to sit through hours of donkeys, hours of donkeys. And when Clarence came through the sail pen, I mean, my daughter and I were speechless. We couldn't believe that this animal was coming in. We thought he had a broken leg, and we thought, how are they, how, how, how are they even selling this animal? I mean, he's clearly, clearly broken in, in many, many ways. And unfortunately, there are two people in the sail pen, two, two men, and their job is to move these horses around so you can see them from all sides and try to create a little excitement. And they use measures that are not kind to these animals to get them to move around, and they were doing it on Eugene. And I barely couldn't contain myself. And so as he's, he's the auctioneer is rattling off these prices and no one's raising their hand, no one is bidding on him, and I couldn't stand it, and they were, they were getting him out, you know, he didn't sell, so out he goes and they're prodding him to get out and he's limping as hard as he is, and I thought, oh my gosh, and I literally grabbed my head like this, and the auctioneer said, you want him? <laughs> and I said, I'll take him. And I said, how, how much? Like, I didn't even know. How much did I just buy? You can hardly understand these guys going so fast. He said, $50. Oh, wow. So I bought him for $50. And Eugene, uh, we drove home. And I mean, immediately my daughter and I looked at each other and we're like, what did we just do? I mean, we are, this is out of our world. We are not in it for big, full-size donkeys. Uh, he was a stallion, he was an aged adult, uh, and, he had, and he had the feet that he had, and uh, well, this is just a sad look at what the auction is really like, you guys. This was an exotic auction. Those are zebras, those are zebras, and they would tell you, they were like, oh, you can at least feed them. You won't be able to touch them, but you can feed them. So these guys will end up with somebody that's going to have a roadside petting zoo. Um, they will end up with someone who wants to breed them and sell the babies. It, they're terrible places. But um, I'm, I'm digressing about Eugene. This is Eugene today. And that is really a big, far jump. We've had him exactly for one year, almost exactly yesterday, for one year. And Eugene was um, so much work. His feet were so long, and he was completely feral. He was untouchable. Uh, and it was everything that we could do to finally start gaining his trust by I would take grass in there, and if he would trust me to, well, I had to put grass on the ground, and little by little I could get closer to him. We started to make some progress with Eugene, but I couldn't make the progress that we needed. No vet in town would touch him because we couldn't handle him, so no vet was going to come. I reached out to the St. Louis Zoo. I said, can you please, can we have one of your vets come out and shoot a dart and tranquilize him so we can get him gelded? I thought if we could at least lower his testosterone level that maybe that would start to help. I thought that we could um, dart him and we could get his feet worked on. Nothing. The zoo wouldn't come out. The wolf sanctuary vet wouldn't come out. We were like, um, <laughs> I mean, just on a lily pad, we were just by ourselves on this island with this, with this donkey that was unmanageable. And um, fortunately, we re realized that we had worked with a trainer once before, about six, seven, maybe eight years ago um, in mid-Missouri, and all he does is work with donkeys and mules. And I called him up, and I said, Ed, I need some help. 
I can't, I, I can't manage him. And he was very matter of fact, uh, we'll get her done, I'll come on up, we'll get him done. And I was like, Ed, he's really hard. I don't know that you're gonna be able to just get him done. He goes, we'll take care of it. And he came up and I mean, it took him a couple hours and it wasn't for the faint of heart, but we were able to get Eugene's feet trimmed and that started him feeling better. And then shortly after that, it was right before Thanksgiving, we made an agreement that after the holidays, um, we were going to send Eugene to Ed and let Ed work with him. You have to understand, we're used to working with miniature sizes. And now we have an 800 pound animal that I've seen firsthand how hard he kicks. And it's very daunting to be around. And I, I was not the person to do it. And so we recognized that we, and we knew Ed was a good person. And so Ed came up, loaded him up, took him home. And it seems like before I knew it, I was, Ed was texting me pictures of, of Eugene with a blanket on because it was February and he was cold. And Ed was texting me pictures of him, the progress that he was making. All throughout the time that he lived with Ed, I made it a point to drive there every two weeks so that Eugene didn't think that I abandoned him because he's already been through so much. So I always kept my face and myself with Eugene and we then made the decision to send Clarence, the one who was so aggressive, the old pony. And I said, I need you to teach Clarence to be able to live with Eugene and, and not be aggressive with him. And before I knew it, they were living together. And those two boys right now, they live together like they are two peas in a pod. Um, I don't know that I have, uh, I'll just flip through these quick because I know this is getting long, but this is Bernard. These are his hoofs that he came to us with. So this again, a woman in mid-Missouri reached out to me on a Sunday. She said, I have this dwarf, he's two years old. I don't think I'm doing everything that I should be for him. Will you take him? And after I saw a picture of him, I, I have to be responsible about it. And I said, how big is he? Because they all our dwarfs live in one stall. If he was gonna be a big dwarf, I did not have the room. Um, but because he was a kind of a medium size, I could take him. And our farrier happened to be coming that very next day. So we left at five in the morning, drove to get him, brought him back, and then the following day started on his feet. And, um, and so now he's got normal feet, straight legs. He does not cross his front legs anymore like he was. Um, and Bernard is, I, I always say Bernard is, is, he is our old soul in the barn. Bernard isn't one that's going to run out there and play with everyone, but Bernard is going to be the first one to just absolutely press into your chest and just say, you know, pet me, scratch my neck, um, just be quiet with me. That's all he wants and he is just, he's a gem. I'm so happy that we have him. He's, he'll be with us for a year. So those are some of the horses that, that we have. Those are some of the things that they go through. And we're not unique. Um, this, is, this, this is something that happens to horses everywhere. But um, all we try to do is just try to spread awareness and education so that people understand before you make a decision to say, I want to get a miniature horse or I want to get a dwarf horse, understand that there's a lot that goes into it and it's not a nine to five job and it's not a fair weather day job and we're starting to get ready to go into fall so we're going to start to get more rain that's sloppy it's muddy horses can't go out in the mud at least ours don't um, in the winter time it's it's ridiculous it's too cold outside there might be some ice patches in the paddock um, and we get a heavy rain, we get ruts that we've got to fix before we put them outside. There is there is a very small window of when it's good to own a horse <laughs> because weather conditions keep it so that um, winter's tough, it's cold, um, you still got to take care of them. Spring comes, it's torrential rains all the time, the paddocks are always a mess. And then the summer is usually good. We at least have good dry footing, but it's so hot, you have to deal with flies, blah, blah, blah. So you have to understand that there's a lot that goes into caring for them. And it's a, it's a year round 
um, and it's it's a it's a job that you have to think long and hard about because they last a long time. They live a long time. So, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you guys enjoyed. You have a question, what, Nancy? What about questions? Maybe. Yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. So, uh, so for miniature horses, they generally live into their 20s if they've got good health and they're well cared for. Ponies can live 30. Clarence is celebrating his 32nd birthday. Um, so he's proof of a long life. The dwarves are very um, all over the place. Um, depending on the type of dwarfism that they have, depending on their health issues, um, we have one dwarf, Martha, who I'll be bringing here. She has the most fatal form of dwarfism. Her life expectancy was six to 12 months. And on October 13th, Martha's gonna turn six years old. So she has completely skewed that demographic. Um, and yet we have Tubby, uh, one of the other dwarfs that you saw. He's only two years old, and he's battling a torn ligament and severe arthritis, and he's only two. So that's a hard question to answer. Horses can live 20s, 30s. I've even heard of them in the 40s, low 40s. How many do you have right now? Uh, way too many. <laughs> way too many. We have 29 that live at home with us. Um, yeah, so that's a lot. And then we have a few others, uh, other places. Did you have a question? Yes, I have a couple. Uh, I assume that uh, minis and dwarfs are born of normal sized horses? That's a great question. A dwarf is born to miniature horses. So, miniature. yeah, so two miniature horses produce a dwarf if they carry the dwarf gene. Now, whoever I met that their daughter has a farm in Iowa, that, okay, so your daughter is a breeder of the of the utmost intentions. She breeds for confirmation, she breeds for temperament, she breeds for all the right reasons. Most people are not conscientious, like I can almost guarantee you that she does genetic testing on her horses before she breeds them. Most people that breed their miniature horses are what I would consider to be a backyard breeder. They are breeding to sell a horse for $500, $1,000, $2,500, whatever it is. They're not gonna go to the time, trouble, or expense to do genetic testing on their horse. So if one of those horses carries the dwarf gene and they produce a dwarf, well guess what? Now they think they just hit the jackpot because that little baby's gonna go to an auction and it's gonna sell for thousands of dollars. And it's, it's a crying shame because there is nothing about those horses that is healthy. They're, they're all unhealthy and they're a lot of work. But if a, if a backyard breeder produces a dwarf, uh, rather than doing the right thing and taking those horses out of a breeding program, there's a very good chance they're gonna breed them again. So a mini horse that's born of normal sized horses. So those are two different things. So think of horses horse. as there's four sizes of horses. There's a full size horse, there's a pony, there's a miniature horse, and then there's a dwarf miniature horse. So those are all, a horse is its own breed, a pony is its own classification of breed, a miniature horse is as well, and then the dwarfs are a genetic anomaly. So there's four sizes. So a mini never grows up to be a horse, a full-size horse, and a pony never grows up to be a full-size horse. They are the sizes that they are for life. Okay, but mini is born of a full-size horse. No. no, minis are born from miniature horses. They're their own breed. Minis are born from minis. Yes, yeah, minis are born from minis. Okay. And dwarfs are born from minis. Okay. So minis, yeah, and then a dwarf is born from a miniature horse. They could, theoretically they could, and there's a 99% uh, chance that both would die, the mother and the baby. So, you know, hopefully that stuff isn't going on. Yeah. Anyone else have questions? How long do you keep them? For life. For life. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we operate it as a sanctuary, so we don't adopt out our horses. I get asked every, not every day, but every week to sell or buy our horses. Um, and uh, we just, we just don't, they're ours. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Were their feet um, on the miniature set, was that because they weren't taken care of after they were born? 
So the ones that stood on the scale that had such bad ones? Is that what the ones you're talking about? The ones that were crooked. The dwarfs. Yeah, that's just because people don't know how to do it. And farriers don't know how to do it. Farriers are used to working with a just a normal size horse with a normal size hoof, trim it, put on a shoe, and they're done. They're not used to doing all of this um, reconstructive you know, surgery, so to speak, uh, which there's no surgery, but you're just reconstructing how the hoof lands and how you um, attach an extension onto it um, or a shoe onto it to make it grow. Most don't know it, which is why we bring our guy in from Florida. Yeah. Are all your horses shoed? None of them are. None of them? Yeah, so they're all, they're all barefoot. Okay. Yeah. Is it only the dwarfs that have those foot problems? Pretty much. Pretty much. Every now and then you'll find um, another mini or, um, you know, a full of a full-size horse might be born that needs some corrections, but it's, it's for the most part, it's the dwarfs. Yeah. Do you offer tours or give information on how to see or visit them? Yeah, so we do. So, um, you know, everything about us just has just organically grown when we started getting all these horses and people were curious and they wanted to come see us and so yes now we do offer and we have for several years we offer private tours and public tours and toddler tours and um, and we are just about almost to the end of when we will let visitors come in. So the end of October, we're done with the public, so to speak, until the following spring and in April. So people come to us, which 100% of any tour fees for a private tour stays in the barn. That's what goes back to the horses. 100% of anything we sell from our gift shop stays in the barn and goes to the horses. Um, once a month, we offer a free public tour, and uh, we have um, 60 people that sign up, and every time we're full to capacity. And then toddler tours are just a short little 30-minute visit with little tiny kids. It's their, usually their first introduction to horses. We let them meet a dwarf, which is about their size. We let them understand how the horses live in a stall, what they eat. We show them how, how hay is made and, and what food they eat, and they get to brush them, and it's, it's a super fun time for them to understand what horses are like. Yeah. Yeah. So they get bad because nobody knew what to do. So when a horse's hoof is born and it's immediately under its foot, uh, people will just scratch their head and be like, I don't know, but you know what? He seems to get around okay, so I guess it doesn't bother him. That's what they think. That's the mentality. And they're like, oh, no, no, he can, he can walk. Well, he walks in pain. That's all they knew. That's all they knew. So unless these horses find their way to someone who knows what they're doing, they will live lifelong in pain. And it's so sad. And they often live just a very short life, a very short, painful life. So. When did you develop your love for horses? Well, I always loved horses, but um, this kind of took it to a different level. <laughs> this was never my plan. Uh, it just, it, it just, like I said, it organically grew once we got our first two. Um, <laughs> The woman that I bought them from called me about six weeks later, and she said, oh, Stacy, I'm at an auction. There's a mother and a baby here that I thought you might like. And I said, no, oh, Mary, I don't want them. I said, I have two. I wanted one. <laughs> She's on speakerphone. There you go. <laughs> And so, um, and so anyway, she sent me a picture of this, this, this mare and her baby. I didn't even see the baby, I just saw the mother. And it had a child on her, her back. And she was completely ratty and gross and everything else. And I said, if you'll bring them in, I'll take them. And it just was this spiral effect. We did not plan on doing this. I didn't grow up thinking this is what I'm gonna do. But it just happened, and now on social media, 
our whole platform is about educating people and doing um, what we're doing here today. And we have over a million followers on social media that listen to stories about our horses and follow along with what they're going through. And you can't believe how um, attached people get that have never met our horses and how attached they are to them. So anytime you guys want to come out and see us, we'd love to have you. But we will be back. We will bring some horses here to see you. Okay, thank you so much.